ADAPT 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, It's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have with me Kevin Long from the longview.com.au. Now, Kevin from Australia has offered his quarterly website forecasting service since 2008 for farmers as a community service to help people navigate their way through cyclical, non-carbon dioxide climate change in southeastern Australia, specific area on the planet. Kevin's based in Bendigo, Victoria, and he offers weather commentary for Murray-Darling Basin. And as we all talk about sunspot activity and lunar cycle influences, but Kevin takes it a step further by integrating global sea surface temperature anomalies Southern Oscillation Index, Madden Julian Oscillation, the Indian Dipole, the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, thermohaline circulation that we hear so much about in the Atlantic Ocean. And he's put out the winter forecast for southern or southeast Australia, but since they're going into the springtime, it still is just as valid talking about the drier lunar air tide transition phase and what we can expect moving just as a planet down the road. With the 18.6-year lunar cycle influences up to 2020 and then a new cycle starts in 2028, what can we expect with wetter climates, drier climates? How is this going to affect our agriculture globally? But we have somebody here who is pinpointing a spot on the planet, and this is what I'm very excited about, is trying to get all of these people together to pinpoint everywhere on the planet where we grow a major abundance of our wheat and different crops that we consume because we're going to have to start thinking about mitigating or moving grow zones or at least trying to bring agriculture indoors as the natural yields in the outdoor environments start to diminish. Well, I guess I'd like to highlight the fact that the lunar cycle is also enhanced by the planet cycle, the synodic cycle of Jupiter and Saturn. And when Jupiter and Saturn are closest together, as they will be next year and the year after, it has a minimising effect on our rainfall. And that enhances the minimum effect of the lunar cycle when they're both working together. And that's what's coming up in the next 12 months, two years, is the first time in 297 years these two cycles are both falling in the same year. So they're having an enhancement of, of each other's cycle and creating greater extremes 9.3 years apart in our climate in Australia in particular. I got onto this many years ago and uh, I've been studying it and I can see that uh, over the last 50 or 100 years as these two cycles have moved closer and closer together and finally become synchronised. In 2010, we had our wettest year ever on our record, some 50 millimetres higher than it was 37 years before at the previous cycle peak. Does that sort of get your ears open and say, well, what's going on here? It does indeed, because even if we bring it up to a little bit closer time frame, all the floods where we saw the water coming off of Ayers Rock and just the flooding of the deserts and the blooming and the greening of the outback that they hadn't seen in generations as well, and that all ties into it. But the most important thing is our crops. You talked about these overlapping cycles both occurring finally in the same year after 297 years. So think about what the extreme will be for lack of rainfall for this moving forward. Because South Africa is going offline due to politics, 
And if Australia starts to go offline as well due to drought, where does that leave us with other possible substitutions for millions and tens of millions of tons of lost wheat That's production? right. Well, this year in particular, New South Wales is, I think, 98% declared drought this year. And uh, there's hardly a crop between the northern border and the southern border of New South Wales. And that represents about a third of the eastern half of Australia's food production. Half of Queensland is in a similar situation and the northwestern half of Victoria is the same and I don't think there'll be any profitable crops grown in possibly half of the Murray-Darling Basin this year and the rest of it's going to be very poor as well. So with the Bureau of Meteorology down in Australia, are they taking into consideration forecasters like yourself or what Jennifer Morrissey is also talking about, these same cycles coming through? There's been a lot of manipulation in temperature data in the Bureau of Meteorology, but are any of their scientists or the government bodies in Australia taking a look at anything other than CO2 at the moment? Because moving forward, I mean, you know, grain production is a major exporter and major earner for Australia. The Bureau's forecast is for drier than normal conditions right through the spring. Their forecasts are similar to mine at the moment, but we're in extreme dry at the moment. I like them. Parts of New South Wales are only had about 20% of their normal rainfall for this year so far. And that means just nothing grows. And we've just about used up all the hay reserves that we had. And keep in mind that only two years ago in 2016, we had one of our best growing seasons in living memory. We had 200% rain and started in about April and ran through to October. It was a very good season and grew possibly six times more hay than what we'd normally have. And that was, every hay shed was full two years ago and lots of hay was stored outside. Well, it's nearly all gone. Nearly all been used up this year. Yeah, you know, I can say the exact same thing is happening in the southeast United States because I've had a couple Mm -hmm. interviews with, with people, for example, Dr. Anita Bailey, who wrote the book Cold Times, And she's saying the same thing. Out in their farming communities there, they do not have enough hay. People are actually selling off part of their herds because they just can't afford to feed them. So when we get into this, hay is a luxury where they were actually trucking it in from different states. But the price on that was astronomical compared to what. And they're not even getting two cuts out of the field. They were barely even getting one. So from Tasmania up to the middle of New South Wales at something like $400 a round bale. And farmers just can't afford that. They're going broke just trying to keep their breeding stock alive. Yeah, that's a sto- that is the same story again and again that you're hearing around the planet. And I don't care which continent you're on. It's happening in Asia, but it's more with bird out here. It's the same thing. The, the feed is just getting too expensive for the animals. So at what point does the feed get too expensive for people when they can't really afford it anymore? And what's the pushback in society going to be? That's a whole different discussion than what's driving the weather with you know, sunspot activity and lunar cycles. But again, it all kind of winds back together with the civilization cycle, extreme boosts in creativity and knowledge and arts and literature. And then we have these dark areas, if you will. I see that whenever we have a solar minimum cycle as we're having, uh, the capitalistic societies of us, of the world are going to be under great pressure. Yeah, and maybe that would explain some of the crazy politics that we look and see today. Because if you look the way a lot of monetary policy is globally and how politicians or at least leaders of governments across the planet are behaving, you look at that and say, that's not right. Why, is the, why are they doing that? But, you know... Again, I think it's all tied together. I think it just has to be. Because in your own opinion, where do you think we're going into in terms of cooling for for the globe? Are we going to drop 1.5C? Because in your website, you you know, you know listed, you talked about the Maunder minimum, the Dalton minimum, these grand solar minimums themselves. All I can say is I would expect that we're going to move back to the same sort of temperatures that we were in the early 1800s when we're having the Dalton minimum period. I'm not really convinced we're going to go back to the Maunder minimum period at this stage because I think that that occurs in the middle of the 1,000 year cycle. So we've got a while to go before we come into one of those again, I believe. Yeah, so you use the word homogenization there, and I'm familiar with it, but a lot of listeners are not. You know, we have the raw data sets, then we have this homogenized set. Essentially, the Bureau is not accepting any weather recordings and weather information prior to 1910 because they're saying that the Stevenson screen wasn't standardised across Australia so any of those earlier figures are not relevant. They could use computer models and 
and uh, do the corrections between the Stevens and screens and the various other systems that were in play before the Stevens screen was put in. But as well as that, what they also do is back in the early period, whenever they saw an extreme hot day, they say, well, that day can't be right. We'll have to replace that. The longview.com.au subscription service there. And again, uh, you can talk to Kevin directly if you're in that service. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Kevin. Great interview, and I'm so thankful that I had a chance to talk to you and share ideas. And I'll leave all the links below in the description box so you can go directly to the site. Goodbye, David. Bye.